Welcome back to Worth Your Fit Woodworking. In a small series of video that I'm kind of calling the prerequisite series. Basically the information you need to gather before you even start the craft so that you can actually understand all the educational material out there. And today we're going to dive a little ways into probably the one of the most misunderstood areas of our craft. The trees. <laughs> Now, if you think about it, the tree is the oldest building material we have had. I mean, trees actually do predate humans. Whether you believe in the Bible and God brought them forth a few days before that he brought forth us, or they've actually been here for millions of years before grass came onto this planet. Trees have been one of our main resources, and yet over that entire time, they were never designed as a building material. Their only purpose that through this entire time has to capture carbon from the air and sunlight from the sky, water from the ground. That's all they're designed to do. I mean, squirrels and birds and stills use, utilize them and stuff for housing, but they weren't really designed for human housing. I mean, they are the original round peg that we try to make fit into square holes. Most woodworkers nowadays don't really think about how the wood, the material they're actually using, the wood, grew in the tree. And while in the past, you know, centuries, we as woodworkers used the entire tree. I mean, everything from the trunk to the canopy, down even to the roots. Nowadays, because of production logging and milling and stuff like that, most of us really only use from about a foot above the ground to about a foot below the first branch. Now right now, I'm out in a local pecan orchard, so obviously this uh, place is not grown for harvesting the wood itself. They're looking for the pecans. But it can give us a good example of the elements of the trees we use commonly nowadays. Now, why do we only use from about a foot above the ground to a little bit below the second branch? Well, basically it comes down to wood moves and it moves in two different ways either through the drying process or through the milling and working process and that's what we're going to talk about right now because what well, wood is not a homogeneous substance there are stresses involved in it and if you think about it the reason why wood has such great building construction ability as a material is because it can deal with all, a lot of stress. A lot of weight can be bared down on the tree in this direction because it grew to handle a lot of weight. That entire canopy of the tree, if you think about it, it's all being hinged on the first branch. Half of the weight of the tree is coming out this way, torquing its way down here. Half the tree is coming out that way, trying to split that tree in half. So a tree has to grow with a very dense bundle of what I call ligaments. Some people call it the crotch of the tree. Uh, others call it the flame of the tree because working this area of a tree produces a very beautiful piece of wood. But there's a lot of stress in there. It makes it very, very hard. And that stress progresses up through the branches. Because you have the pith of the tree running up the center and it will break off and run this way and run this way. But it doesn't run towards the center. If you've ever cut a tree and a half and a branch and a half, you can see the different placements of the pith. In an ideal world, the wood we get from the tree, from the trunk, well, you've seen the pictures. You have the pith in the center and even rings working their way out. But in order to balance all that weight that a branch is having, what happens is the pith grows up towards the top of the branch and all the wood comes up underneath it. Because the pith is the balancing point whether uh, pressure is coming this way or that way. So if it's all pushing up on that branch, you develop all the muscle on that side of the branch. Now here's the problem. If you have a board that's milled from a piece of wood that has a lot of tension or a lot of reaction wood, a lot of times you can't tell that just by looking at the end grain. 
because all you see is those grain direction. But once you start working on with that wood, you take a plane shading off of this side of the wood, well, all of a sudden, it releases a lot of tension on that side, so the, bow, the board starts to cup up, then bend up. Then you release material off of this side, it bends the other way. So you are perpetually fighting taking shavings off of one side of the board, having it spring one direction, the other side, so you can never get it dead straight, dead flat. So anytime you have internal stress in the tree caused by how it grew, whether it be a branch wood, or more commonly in what you will find in the market is just a tree that grew kind of leaning. So there was a, the tree needed to put pressure on one side as it grew to keep the tree from going straight up. Well, then you get that reaction wood, and that wood is pretty much useless for making things like tabletops, table legs, turnings, and stuff like that. Horrible for turning because as you're turning it, it starts to wobble because you're relieving stress on one side more than the other and it starts bending on the lathe. Reaction wood can also be somewhat dangerous if you're using power tools like what we would have in a small shop. Because imagine if you were pushing a board through something like your table saw where you have the fence and the blade. Well, if you remove wood on one side and it starts to bend as you're cutting it, you're cutting it here, it's bending all the way through here it could put a lot of force on the back of the blade, even catching on the tooth and getting thrown back at you. That's a kickback. That is why riving knives have become so important in table saw construction. Because if you put a riving knife behind the blade right here, the thinking is the pressure of a reaction wood bending into the blade its force gets placed right there instead of on the blade, so it's less likely to ride into a tooth and get thrown back at you. That's the pretty much main purpose of a riving knife, is to prevent the back of the blade being pinched. But, the wood can also bend this way. And that would put, as you cut into it, the force is actually going against the fence right here and right here, and as you move it over, there's a lot of pressure going right here. And that can cause your the piece to get all of a sudden become harder to push through. So you end up forcing it, creating a dangerous situation with your hand going towards the blade. Or the whole machine just binds and locks up. So, reaction wood in power tools can be incredibly dangerous. So one of the reasons why they, uh, the old timers, where they didn't have as good a quality wood coming out of mills and stuff like that, they would say you never cut the thin pieces off against the fence because that's where all you would remove more of the pressure on one side or the other uh, on a thin piece than on a thick piece. A thick piece can deal with a little bit of pressure and still maintain most of its shape. You cut a thin piece off and it removes all the pressure that's associated with it, it's going to flex a lot. So what a lot of times they would do is they would put the thick side of the board here and cut the fence, the small piece, on this side so that if there was tension either coming this way or that way, it was going into air and not binding itself up against the fence. So that is why loggers and stuff, when they're harvesting a tree, generally they cut it in 8, 12, 16 foot sections, whatever their log, uh, mill is taking in, as long as they can start, you know, about a foot above the ground to below that first branch. Because as you can see, and as when you were playing as a kid, as the tree gets closer to its roots, it starts to spread out. And that spreading action has a lot of tension in it. And that's why sometimes you can go to a lumber mill, and if you look at a board, it'll be dead straight. And then at the very end, it'll kind of work off one way or the other well as you can see where did that come from a tree maybe they got a little bit too close to the branch or the root ball when they were cutting that board out trying to get just that little bit extra wood now quick side note softwoods are a little bit different what I've been discussing has mainly been with hardwoods which is kind of what a lot of us use but if you're using a lot of pine they don't really go by that first branch thing because the branches come out of pine differently than they do hardwood. 
A lot of times uh, branches of hardwoods don't radiate from the pith. They just uh, come out in little spuds on the bark and they can come straight out. And those, when they are uh, growing the lumber for harvesting, they will cut the lower branches off really early in the growth cycle so that that's how you get those little pinhole knots in your boards that aren't very big. If you just let them grow grow naturally, you will get much bigger knots in a lot of your boards. Plus the fact that they pack these trees so tightly when they're growing them. Well, those bottom branches aren't doing that much as far as gathering sunlight. It's all the stuff at top, which is why they can get very long, straight grain with maybe only minor pinholes throughout a board. Uh, but again, softwoods are a little bit different than they are when they are graded and harvested. Now, this is kind of a general uh, course series. So this is what you're finding when you're going to the big box store to buy lumber. But there, again, there are a lot of us in the wood turning world that will seek out different parts of the tree to do different things. We will use the entire tree, but that's kind of a subset of a subset of a subset of woodworkers that are in craft. And it's hard to find those kind of people. So in production, milling and stuff like that, they don't really use this kind of wood, the canopy, branches, root wood, to make the boards you're buying to build the furniture and other houses and stuff like that. But there's really one aspect of trees that confuses even experienced woodworkers, or I should say frustrates them, and that's wood movement. Because while I am standing in an orchard of living trees, these all will eventually become zombies. The movies have proven that zombies are just the corpses of previously live hosts, just like boards are uh, corpses of trees. And as Romero has proven, it doesn't matter how much many parts of a zombie you cut off, they will still want to come after you. And zombies eat. And when they do eat, they typically will get fatter, but have you ever seen a zombie get shorter or taller? They might starve and get really, really skinny, but they never really shrink or grow height-wise. And that's the same with these trees that have been zombified by us cutting them up and taking them into our homes. When we cut a tree down, a good 70 to 80 percent of the weight of that tree is just the water that's bound inside the cells of the tree and it's flowing up and down. And it used to be that the old lumber people, they would actually stack logs up in like a, a teepee. And if you looked at the ground underneath it, it was just a muddy mess, even if they were in a drought. Because you have basically free water. That's the water that was running up and down to the leaves and stuff like that. And then bound water. And that's the water that was inside the cells of the tree. That free water would react with gravity and you could lose about half the weight of a tree within those first few days if you could somehow just let that free water come out of it. But the bound water, it takes a lot more effort to get out of it. And it's that bound water that once it's removed, think of a sponge, you know, you're washing your dishes, you put the sponge on the sink. When you put it there, it's nice rectangular, but as it dries, it shrinks. Because that water had mass to it, so it, whenever it leaves that area, it leaves a, a gap, a vacuum, so to speak, and things contract at, to fill that space. Which is why if you go out to you know, your firewood pile, if you don't cut a log out, you will see huge splits developing in the log because the water has left so that tension has uh, become so great that it has to separate out so that it can fill the space that the water used to exist in. But when that water comes out, the tree doesn't really change its shape height-wise because the bones of its structure, bones don't really shrink. Uh, when water comes out. Muscle mass, the ligaments, that kind of stuff like on our bodies, that will shrink as it dries out, but not necessarily the bones. 
or trees are somewhat the same way. So it will maintain the height, but it will change quite a bit of diff, uh, quite a bit in width. But remember us saying trees are round pegs, and we try to peg, put them into square holes. Well, that's where a lot of the confusion comes into, because the tree was never meant to be square. The growth rings of a tree designate its age. We've all learned that as kids and stuff like that. You can count the rings and see how long it's grown. Well, those growth rings come about between the differences between a tree that's going really fast in spring and summer and when it starts to go dormant, you know, winter, winter, winter and fall. Uh, it becomes a lot denser when it's not growing as much and a lot more open when it's growing really fast. So there's where the color variations come from in some species. When it's growing fast, there's a lot of water absorption into the cells, obviously. They swell up pretty fat and healthy and stuff like that, and that's what causes the growth, and that's what causes the massive uh, distance between growth rings. In a really healthy season, lots of sunlight, lots of rain, there's lots and lots of growth, so you'll see a bigger gap between the, the, the rings. In a drought situation, the gaps can get really, really small, which is why a lot of times people might prefer wood that comes from a drier climate because the growth rings are tighter together, whereas lumber mills and stuff like that might like to grow wood in a really wet environment because it grows really thick and fast, thick and fast and tall quicker. As the wood dries, most of the drying action comes from the rapid growth cells because they were the plumpest to begin with. So this area right here loses the most water and it shrinks the most. This distance shrinks. And as it shrinks, it tries to, because there's less material in all directions, those growth rings tend to want to straighten out. So as it loses moisture, it straightens and flexes one way. But there are situations where it will gain moisture. When we buy lumber, it has been dried, that's where the term comes from, to, uh, you know, a, a uh, equilibrium level with the moisture in the air. So, if you are in a very humid climate and you build a piece of furniture where the wood is dead flat outdoors in an unair conditioned warehouse, well, you can make it perfectly flat, but then you take that same board and put it into an air conditioned building or even worse in winter when we got our heaters running and everything like that and all the moisture comes out of the air well the mo moisture content of the wood is obviously going to go, go down as it works to reach equilibrium with the air so even after hundreds of years of being dead that wood is still absorbing moisture it's eating and letting moisture go and as it does it moves so you have something that dead that's dead that eats and breathes and moves around trees are zombies in our furniture look around your house you have zombies everywhere the thing but the thing of dealing with zombies that if you have learned anything else from the walking dead is you have to learn how to control them now, if you've studied woodworking very much at all, you have probably seen this diagram where they take a cookie from a tree, a cross section from the tree, and they divide up how we get the different boards from it. And if you take a board from right here in a tree, I want you to look at the grain, okay? A very short piece of a line cannot straighten itself out very much. So this kind of board we say is very, very stable because it's not going to go up and down like that. But as these growth rings shrinks, the overall board will shrink a little. So when we build furniture, a lot of times we build it so that this kind of wood will have a little bit of movement, but we don't really worry about it being flat. That would make like great doors and stuff like that. Frame pieces. 
structural pieces. But if you were to take a board from right here in a tree, once again, look at the grain. You have a long growing path. That, that board, as a, it loses moisture, is going to want to flatten out. Now, yes, that board right there might uh, warp a lot as it dries, but a lot of times when we're buying this kind of stuff, you buy an oversized board so that as it warps, you can mill it back to get the board you want. Okay, But it's one of those situations that you milled it back and you put it in your piece of furniture at one humidity level. And if you put it in a house or you move it outside or you change climate or anything that affects the moisture content of the air, it's going to start moving a little bit. Now I want you to think about what would happen if you took a board from a corner like that right there. Well, once again, the distance between the grain as it dries is going to shrink. So this point right here is going to come up a little bit. And that point right there is going to go down a little bit. Plus the fact that the grains themselves are going to want to slightly straighten out. So what happens is you end up with a piece of wood that's kind of a diamond shape one way or the other. Now when you're buying wood, the cut you get is basically how the thing. They basically call this quarter sawn, this is rift sawn, and that is flat sawn. And in each board you're going to get a different grain pattern. This board right here, well the grain is going to come up and you're going to have those big U's, the cathedrals, like that. This board right, board right here it's going to have nice straight lines on one side, but on the corner side, it's going to have those cathedrals, because that's that right there. This board right here is going to have straight lines in every single direction. So as tree morticians, we've got to learn to control our zombies, and that's how a lot of woodworking techniques have evolved over the years. It was less about we want to uh, have this look. It was more we want a door to fit in a doorway, doorway and stay tight for centuries. We don't want to switch around. So doors, you will notice, developed so that you have boards that make up a frame. oriented so that the distance of the door well will not change because a tree is not going to shrink height wise it's only going to shrink this way and if you don't have very much space for it to very much distance for it to move that doesn't really matter this is called a frame and panel design because in the center section right here, they can put pretty much any kind of wood they want. Maybe they put a nice flat sawn piece of wood that's going to have a lot of movement this way, but inside the board, they have a little gap around there to allow it to move back and forth. It's not going to move too much this way, so they don't need as big a gap on the top and bottom. But that center, that panel, being able to move stretch on the inside is a key feature of a frame and panel design so that you can create something that will go into a certain space and not change. That's really common with doors, windows, boxes, or even something like paneling where they can use a very thin piece of wood in the panel for a room and only have thicker pieces in certain sections to get more use and more uh, coverage out of a certain amount of wood. Now this requirement of having to deal with movement when you're dealing with, with solid lumber has led to a lot of people using sheet goods. 
Now, sheet goods are not something new. They've been using it for centuries. But in the modern area where we can mass produce it, it's kind of taken over. And what is a sheet good and how does it make itself dimensionally stable? Well, basically what it does is it takes advantage of the fact that trees don't shrink height-wise and width-wise. If you make it thin enough, you can lock it into a certain uh, thickness or width. So what manufacturers do is they slice a tree up into very thin sections. They can either do it radially, where it's like they have a razor blade and they just spin the log and they take thin sheets off of the edge, or they can do, I forget what the term is, but they, they slice it like that. And that will get you different looks and also different attributes. And then what they creatively do is they will, imagine you are, the tree is uh, straight up and down on the top and bottom of a four by eight sheet or however much they did it, the longer distance, they will lay the slice, whether they did it radial or horizontally, so that the grain goes up and down. But in, the, in between those two pieces, they have many different layers that alternate, going this way, up and down, left and right, up and down, left and right, and they lock them together with both glue and heat and pressure so that the cells, the lignums of the different layers will actually bond to each other and because trees don't shrink height wise well these cells right these right here will lock its distance this way pretty solidly and the ones that are going up and down will lock it that distance pretty solidly that way that's also why they can use very cheap wood on the interior panels and then put really nice premium wood on the exterior in a very thin veneer so what's weird about it to me is whenever you're cutting wood if you're cutting it lengthwise like up and down a tree we generally could refer that to as a rip cut and if you're going across the tree it's a cross cut well if you think about it plywood doesn't have a rip or cross cut so you're always going because at some point in time you're always going across the grain and with grain at, this, at the same time of the cut. So generally when they were talking about rips and cross cuts in plywood, they're talking about the grain direction of the outside panels or the show panel if the backside is different. The other type of sheet cuts we commonly use in the craft are OSB, oriented strand board. And that's actually where they pulverize a tree. They're actually splitting it, not cutting it or slicing it so that they get, get really strong grains and then they take those little strips and they lay them in a mat and they lay them at different angles so that the growth or the movement counteract each other and then again with heat pressure and glue they get a very uniform thickness that isn't going to change its dimension too much as long as you don't get it too wet <laughs> then the other one is mdf um, medium density fiber board and that's basically using that same heat glue and pressure but smaller pieces of wood namely sawdust and that kind of stuff and the finer the wood the finer the mdf you get now plywood manufacturers will oftentimes use mdf i don't really know if they anybody uses osb on but they use it on the interior of plywood uh, so that they can get a nice uniform thickness and a lot of high-end furniture makers will also do that one where they will put a very, th a f fairly thick uh, show face on MDF when they're making their pieces just so that they can gain the stability of the MDF and still get the looks of solid wood. But as you understand that now, you will get a real chuckle if you go visit some of these mass manufactured furniture places. Because you look at their work and you'll say, well, that just doesn't make sense. Grains can't go against each other like that. And you'll realize, well, basically you're buying MDF, uh, MDF sheets with wood grain. Cause, so it doesn't even matter that it's going against the rules of nature as they build, build the construction together. So, so far we have studied how all woodworking tools work. And then we analyze what kind of questions we need to ask ourselves when we're buying tools. 
And today, we basically studied the material we use with those tools. Uh, hopefully, this gave you a general idea of why we build this way we do. Now, here's a box I made probably 15 years ago. I have glass panels in it. So why would I use a frame and panel design? Well, the glass isn't going to move, but the frame might if I put it in just a panel straight across, and that could be bad. Also, the bottom of a drawer. Hear it? It's loose. Why would I do it loose? Well, we have a cross-grain action where this board, the tree, is growing this way. This one was the width of the tree, so I had to incorporate some movement. So I put it in a groove so it is panel design. The way we build is because of the material we build with. So before our next exercise, your home next video, your homework, I just want you to pick a piece of furniture you see in your home or wherever you live and ask yourself, why did they build it that way? Why did they use that material in that orientation? Was it because it had to deal with the strength of the tree? mainly being up and down as we learned in the uh, first video and it's very weak going sideways or did they do it because the wood moves a certain way so they had to deal with how they controlled their zombies i hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about your material maybe with this knowledge the joinery that you're learning in the future or how you use your tools in the future will make a lot more sense. You'll understand the reason why we do things the way we do in this craft. Y'all be safe, have fun, and remember, it's always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others.